Speaking of Satoshi and gauge theory, you've mentioned to Brian Keating that you may be releasing a geometric unity paper this year or some other form of uh, additional material mm -hmm. on the topic. Uh, what is your thinking around this? What's the process you're going through now? Well, it's very in preparing this. I, uh, I used April 1st to try to start a tradition, which I hope to use to liberate mankind. The tradition is that at least one day a year, you should be able to say heretical things and not have Jack Dorsey boot you off or Mark Zuckerberg. Your provost shouldn't call you up and say, what did you say? We need at some level to have a jubilee from contr centralized control. And so my, my hope is that, you know what a tradition is in America? Something a baby boomer did twice. Impeachment? <laughs> <laughs> That's very funny. Uh, anyway, um, so when I'm, I'm not a baby boomer, but as an Xer, I've thought about whether or not April 1st would be a good date on which to release a printed version of what I already said in lecture form, because I think it's hysterically funny that the physics community claims that it can't decode video. A lecture, yeah, I, it must be paper. And you know what? There will be a steady stream of new complaints up until the point that they fit it into a narrative that they like. Um, yeah, I'm thinking about April 1st uh, as a date in which to release a document and it won't be perfectly complete, but it'll be very complete. And then they'll try to say, it's wrong, or you already did it, or no, it, that was dumb, but what we just did on top of it is brilliant, or it doesn't match experiment, or who knows what. They'll go through all of their usual nonsense. It's time to go. Is there still puzzles in your own mind they need to be figured out for you to try to put it on paper. I mean, this, those are different mediums, right? It was a good, great question. I did not count on something that turns out to be important. When you work on your own outside of the system for a long time, you probably don't think you're gonna be doing this as a 55 year old man. And I have been so long outside of math and physics departments, and I've been occupied with so many other things as you can see, that the old idea that I had was if I always did it in little pieces, then I was always safe because it wouldn't be stealable. And so now those pieces never got assembled completely. In essence, I, I have all the pieces and I can fit them together, but there's probably a small amount of glue code. Like there are a few algebraic things I've forgotten how to do. I may or may not figure them out between now and April 1st. But it's pretty complete. But that's the puzzle you're kind of uh, tr struggling to now figure out, to get it all on in the well, same, again, the, the glue together. I can't tell you whether the theory is correct or incorrect. But like, you know, for example, there's what's the exact form of the supersymmetry algebra or how what's the rule for passing a minus sign through a particular operator. And all of that stuff got a lot more difficult because I didn't, I didn't do it every, look, you know, it's a little bit like, uh, if you're, you know, if you're a violinist and you don't touch your violin regularly for 15 years, you come back to it and you pretty much know the pieces sort of, but there's lots of stuff that's missing. Your tone is off and that kind of stuff. I would say I've got, I'll get the ship to the Harbor and it'll require a tugboat probably to get it in. And, and if the tugboat doesn't show up, then I'll pilot the thing right into the dock myself, but it's not a big deal. I, I think that it is essentially complete. Psychologically, just as a human being, this is, uh, I remember perhaps by accident, but maybe there's no accidents in the universe. I was tuned in, I don't remember what where, reference? on April 1st. Yeah. To you, uh, oh, I think in your Discord. Yeah. Uh, kind of thinking about, thinking through this release. I mean, yeah. it wasn't like, uh, it wasn't obvious that you were going to do it. You were thinking through it. And I remember there was intellectual, personal, psychological struggle with this. Yeah. Right? Well, because I did. I thought it was dangerous. Yeah. If this turns out to be right, I don't know what it unlocks. I'm. If it's wrong, I, I think I understand where we are. If it's wrong, it'll be the first fool's gold that really looks like a theory of everything. It'll be the iron pyrites of physics. 
And we haven't even had fool's gold, in my opinion, yet. Got it. So what is your intuition why this looks right to you? Like why it feels like it would be, if if wrong, the first I can say it gold. very simply. It's way smarter than I am. Can you break that apart a little more? It's like every time you poke at it, it's giving you intuitions that follow with the, the, the currently known physics. Well, let's put it in computer science terms. Yes, please. Okay. There's a concept of technical debt that computer scientists struggle with. Mm -hmm. As you commit crimes, you have to pay those crimes back at a later date. Mm -hmm. In general, most of the problem with physical theories is that as you try to do something that matches reality, you usually have to go into some structure that gets you farther away. And your hope is, is that you're going to be able to pay back the technical debt. And it, in general, these wind up as check kiting schemes. Or like you're funding a startup and there are too many pivots, right? So you, you keep adding epicycles in order to, to cover things that have gone wrong. My belief is, is that this thing represents something like a summit to me. And I'm very proud of having found a route up this summit. But the route is what's due to me. The summit can't possibly be due to me. You know, like Edmund Hillary and, and Tenzing Norgay did not create Mount Everest. They know that they didn't create Mount They They figured out a way up. You got to tell me what uh, Mount Everest is in this metaphor relative and also connected to the technical debt. So technical debt is, an, is a negative thing that it's kind of, you, you will eventually have to pay it. Absolutely. Are you saying in the in the ascent that you're seeing now so you, in the theory yeah. is you do not have much technical debt? Well, that's right. I think that what happens is is that early on, what I would say is I believe now that the physics community has said many things incorrectly about the current state of the universe. They're not wildly off, which is why. Like for example, the claim is that there are three generations of matter. I do not believe that there are three generations of matter. I believe that there are two generations of matter. And there is a third collection that looks like a generation of matter as the first two, only at low energy. Okay, well that's not a frequent claim. People imagine that there are three or more generations of matter. I would claim that that's false. People claim that the matter is chiral, that it, is it knows it's left from its right. I would claim that the chirality is not fundamental, but it is emergent. We could keep going at all these sorts of things. People think that it, space time is the fundamental geometric, geometrical construct. I do not agree. I think it's something that I've termed the observers. All of these different things represent a series of overinterpretations of the world that preclude progress. So you you gave I think you gave uh, some credit to string theory as uh, string theory and I think loop qu quantum gravity if I remember correctly as as like getting close to the fool's uh, gold. Well, I've, I said that Garrett Lisi, Garrett Lisi phenomenologically gets a lot of things right. He gets he has, he's got a reason for chirality, a reason for uniqueness using E eight. In fact, E eight uses something called vial fermions, which are chiral. He has a way of getting geometry to get Riemann's geometry underneath general relativity to play with Erismann's geometry, which is underneath the standard model using something called Cartan connections that are out of favor. He's figured out something involving super connections to make sure that the fermion, the matter in the system isn't quantized the same way as the bosons were, which is a problem in his old theory. He's got something about three generations for triality. He's got a lot of phenomenological hits. I, I don't think Garrett's theory works. It also has a very simple Lagrangian. He's basically using the Yang-Mills uh, norm squared, the same thing you would use as a, as a cost function uh, if you were doing neural nets, okay? The string theorists have a different selling point, which is, is that they may have gotten a renormalizable theory of gravity if quantum gravity was what we were meant to do. And they've done some stuff with black holes that they can get some solutions uh, correct. And then they have lots of agreements with where they show mathematical truths that mathematicians didn't even know. 
I'm very underwhelmed by string theory based on how many people have worked on it and how little is supporting the claims to it being a theory of everything. But those are the two that I take quite seriously. I don't yet take Wolfram's quite seriously because if he really finds one of these uh, cellular automata that are really distinct and ge generative, it'll be amazing. But he's looking for such a thing. I don't think he's found anything. Teg Tegmark, I view as a philosopher who is somehow taking credit for Platonism, which I don't see any reason for fighting with Max because I like Max. But if it ever comes time, I'm putting a post-it note that I'm not positive the mathematical universe hypothesis is really anything new. Um, and in general, uh, loop quantum gravity really, I think, grew out of some hopes that the general relativistic community had for that they would be able to do particle theory. And I don't think that they've shown any particle theoretic realism. So essentially, here's what I really think, Lex. I think we didn't understand how big the difference between an effective theory and a theory of everything is conceptually. Maybe it's not mathematically that different, but conceptually trying to figure out what a theory of every, how does the universe, and I've, I've compared it to Escher's drawing hands. Mm -hmm. How do two hands draw themselves into existence? That's the puzzle that I think has just been wanting. And I, I, I'll be honest, I'm really surprised that the theoretical physics community um, it didn't even get up on their high horse and say this is the most stupid nonsense imaginable. Because clearly, I'm—I I always say I'm not a physicist, so I'm just a—I'm—I'm—I'm an, I'm a, I'm an amateur with a heart as big as all outdoors. So, in in your journey of releasing this, and I'm sure there further, maybe uh, it will be another American tradition on April first that will continue for years I to hope come. So. Uh, in my, there's sort of uh, crumbs along the way that I'm hoping to uh, collect in my naive view of things of the beauty that in your geometric view of the universe. So uh, one question I'd like to ask is, uh, if you were to challenge me to visualize something beautiful, something important about geometric unity in my struggle to appreciate some of its beauty from the outsider's perspective, what would that be, thing be? Interesting question. Perhaps we can both have a journey towards April 1st. <laughs> Take a look at that. Some kind of a scrunchie that I picked up on Melrose, <laughs> uh, not Melrose, uh, Montana in Santa Monica. Now you'll notice that all of those disks rotate independently. Yes. If you rotate groups of those in a way that is continuous, but not uniform everywhere, what you're doing is a so-called gauge transformation Mm -hmm. on the torus seen as a U1 bundle over a U1 space-time. So the concept of space-time here in a very simplified case isn't four-dimensional, but it's one-dimensional, it's just a circle. And there's a circle above every point in the circle represented by those little disks. Imagine, if you will, that we took a rubber band and placed it around here and decided that that was a function from the circle into the circle that is representing a y-axis that's wrapped around itself. Well, you would have an idea of what it means for a function to be constant if it just went all around the outside. But what happens if I tr turn this a little bit? Then the function would be mostly constant. It would have a little place where it dipped and it went back. It turns out that you can transform that function and transform the derivative that says that function is equal to zero when I take its derivative at the same time. That's what a gauge transformation is. Amazing to me that we don't have a simple video visualizing things that I've already had built and that I can clearly demonstrate. When you do that torus, who's the code of the torus is itself, Generating a spinning torque. Yeah. This is a U1 principle bundle. 
And the world needs to know what a gauge theory is, not by analogy, not with Lawrence Krauss saying it's like a checkerboard. If you change some of the colors this way, not saying, you know, that it, it, it's a, it's a a local symmetry involving like it's none of those things. It's a theory of differential calculus where the functions and the derivatives are both subject to a particular kind of change. So that if a function was constant under one derivative, then the new function is constant under the new derivative transformed in the same fashion. And would you put that under the category of just gauge transformations? Yes, that would be gauge transformations applied to sections and connections where connections are the derivatives in the theory. This is easily explained. It is pathological that the community of people who understand what I'm saying have never bothered to do this in a clear fashion for the general public. You and I could visualize this overnight. This is not hard. The public needs to know in some sense that let's say quantum electrodynamics, the theory of photons and electrons, more or less electrons are functions and photons are derivatives. Now there's some, you can object in some ways, but basically a gauge theory is the way in which you can translate uh, a shift in the definition of the functions and the shift of the definition of the derivatives so that the underlying physics is not harmed or changed. So you have to do both at the same time. Now you and I can visualize that. So if what you wanted to do, rather than going directly to geometric unity, is that I could sit down with you and I could say, here are the various components of geometric unity. And if the public needs a visualization in order to play along, we've got a little bit over two months and I'd be happy to work with you. I love that as a challenge and I'll take it on and I hope we do make it happen. And David Goggins, if Lex doesn't do some super macho thing because he's got to work uh, to get some of this stuff done, uh, you'll understand he'll be available to you after April. Thank you for the thank you for the escape clause. I really needed that escape clause. I'm glad that's I'm on worried. record. Forty eight miles in forty eight hours.